I am here with Dr. Jorge Ferrer, and he is going to speak with us about the thoughts from his new book. I want to start off with something clarificatory. Sometimes these words get confused, polygamy and polyamory. What's the difference? Yes. Well, uh, polygamy means like many different relationships in general uh, in, in its etymology, but uh, historically has been associated with like a, you know, like a patriarchal uh, way of relating uh, one man having many different partners, like in certain Mormon society. And uh, remember like the historical reality of harems in the world, like feudal lords, overlords having like all these women, you know, and uh, controlling them, uh, and they are the only ones who can be with them, but these women are exclusive to uh, that, uh, that single man. Well, polyamory uh, is like a more uh, kind of modern, postmodern um, way of relating in which like uh, both men and women uh, can have multiple uh, um, affectionate, romantic, and sexual connections, but with the consent uh, and, um, and knowledge of all the parties. Uh, so it's kind of uh, normally like uh, also presented as a post-patriarchal way of relating in the, in the way that both men and women are the same fruit and it's not the same old story of the guy having like multiple women and the women being at home like with the kids and, and things like that. <laughs> okay, so we're not talking about polygamy, we're talking about polyamory. And yes. you're telling us that we we discuss this difference between polyamory and mon monogamy and that this is not a good binary that we should stick to. So you give us this new concept. But before we get to your new concept, can you tell us what's the difference between polyamory and monogamy and why are these insufficient for us? Well, monogamy is like um, the kind of, um, you know, like, main normal relationship that we have inherited from our culture in which we are supposed to be kind of like exclusively uh, uh, sexually bonded with one only person and romantically and sexually we make vows you are the only one i will love i can have many friends but uh, romantically and sexually I'm, i will only ask one one person and that will be for the rest of the life or also in a new paradigm emerging these days like a serial monogamy one partner after the other well, in polyamory, you can have like a simultaneously uh, di different like romantic, affectionate and sexual connections. And still you can have like a primary connection. But also you can have like also secondary connections. OK, and why is that insufficient for us today? Yes, well, I'll just uh, tell you a bit of my personal story, if I may here because um, I think that, uh, you know, all our works are always rooted biographically. And, uh, you know, for, for many, many years, like uh, after I was raised in Barcelona in Spain and uh, monogamy was the only way to relate. And uh, there was something uh, when I had my first student girlfriend walking in the streets of Barcelona, I felt like, what, what's going on? Like uh, the fact that I'm with this wonderful person means that uh, I cannot love or be loved in a physical, sensual, sexual ways by anyone else in the planet of the 7,700 billion people that were existing there. It felt like really kind of like crazy. And, uh, and therefore, like uh, after I arrived to California, even earlier in Spain, I, for almost 10 years, I lived like kind of more open relationships, like uh, trans ethical, transparent, conscious. And, and after those 10 years, I realized, you know, there is something about, uh, uh, I felt like a pull towards exploring monogamy again. So after 10 years of living in open relationships, I felt I needed to explore what, what, what that in the monogamous container, what was there for me. And uh, I was celibate in, in the middle of, of that. So my trajectory was not linear, uh, was kind of a spiral in many different ways. So when people would ask me after my trajectory, people would ask me, are you monogamous or polyamorous? I would say, well, that's a very, I experienced that as a very repressive question. And I think many, many people today are experimenting that because you are not, you are not one or the other. It's like, a, it's like this box, this ideological box. You have to be, it's like a forced choice today. This is the problem. The problem is not monogamy or polyamory. It's great that people, if they choose, they can be monogamous or they can be polyamorous. The problem is when you are forced to choose between those two categories, you know? So in my book with this new term, novogamy, what I'm trying to do is like to really open the, 
Yes, thank you. Open the, the range of legitimate uh, relational options that we can have beyond that binary choice. And I make always like this kind of like a parallel with what the transgender movement did with the uh, gender binary until maybe like, you know, not long ago, you know, like even one or two decades, like uh, you could only be a man or a woman, male or female, right? And, and the transgender movement uh, show us, you know, through this and other testimony that uh, you can be out of things in between and beyond. So that's what I'm doing with, with this new term. And I map in the book like different development pathways, you know, and modes of relationship that escape that binary. So if somebody wanted to enter into a novogamy relationship, how does that even work? Um, <laughs> what are the containers or is there no container or what exactly does this mean? If this yes. is going to accurately describe you, then what are you? What do you do? What are your limits? Yes, exactly. That's a great question. Thank you. Well, it's a thing of awareness, you know, like, for example, reflecting on that personal trajectory I was sharing before. It's like I realized, like, a, well, uh, I'm being monogamous or polyamorous, depending on different developmental moments in my, in my personal growth, you know. So that's one way which you can realize that you, you are free from the binary or, or you realize that you are really free to choose to choose to be monogamous or polyamorous without serious fears of conflicts, you know? So you are kind of like beyond that kind of binary too. Or also you realize your, your own kind of like intrapersonal diversity, like, you know, like we all have different subpersonalities, different, different ways, like many people are very monogamous in their head, they believe in monogamy, and maybe also they feel monogamous in their hearts, but sexually actually they, they want diversity, they want to be polyamorous. So they can realize that they're like different uh, there's like a lot of diversity within us, you know? So basically what I'm doing is that to really expand all that. And uh, so there is no single way to be monogamous. That's not, there's no single way to be monogamous. It's more like a more fluid uh, way of relating and uh, that you realize that at different moments of your life, you can be one or the other. Also in different contexts, for some people are very monogamous at home in their cities, and then they go to Birmingham Festival or Boom Festival, and then in those in those places, you know, uh, both he and she, uh, if they're like a heterosexual couple, they allow themselves to be more polyamorous, you know. Or there are some people that they are like, you know, monogamous, like uh, in their everyday life, but they go to certain clubs and parties, you know, and then they are poly there, you know. So there are many different ways in which like uh, people are today already breaking that binary. And in a way, like uh, what I'm doing in the book is also kind of like uh, documenting all these different ways that what people are already doing and saying, listen, this is something, this is something new that cannot be captured by this kind of like, you know, limited categories. You are monogamous or polyamorous. Excellent. And what's the strongest objection that you have heard so far to this concept? Yes, thank you. Well, the strongest objection that I've heard is that, uh, you know, in a way, like uh, you are in the danger, you are creating a new relational canon. Because in a way, like as you know from my book, I'm also uh, fighting against like this kind of what I call the monopoly wars, you know? Like this idea that monogamous people look down at poly people, poly people look down at mono people, they judge each other, they feel that their relational style is superior, it's more natural, it's more advantageous, morally, whatever, you know, spiritually uh, superior, you know? So in a way, when you put a new term, uh, it's very easy, you know, that some people say, oh, well, you are enthroning now Nubogami as the new kid in town, you know? You are saying that Nubogami is the way to go, is the, relate, the way to relate, you know, in the 21st century, and it's superior to polyamory and monogamy. I think that's the And of course, when you put the term Nobo, that immediately, like, Nobo is new, right? Immediately creates the, the you know, creates like the, the, uh, the opposite bind, the opposite uh, polar, uh, uh, Polar opposite is like the old, you know? So it's like the new and the old. That's the strongest objection. And what's your response to that objection? Yes. Well, my response is like uh, twofold. On the one hand, uh, as I make the case in the book over and over again, is like, a, you know, like a no style of relationship is superior to each other, but we cannot leave all the styles of relationship for the right or wrong reasons or with more uh, or less mindfulness awareness of social oppression, uh, uh, care, and so forth. So uh, you can be monogamous, you can be polyamorous, you can be novogamous. 
in really kind of like uh, unethical ways or like really ethical ways. Uh, and also you can be those three styles of relationship in a way that is really attuned to your moment, is truth to your growth or not. You can leave them out of coercion, social pressure, fears, uh, psychological fears and so forth. So that on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's like uh, to be novogamous includes like the, you know, like uh, the possible choice, free choice, freer choice of being monogamous or polyamorous, you know? So in a way, like uh, it includes those options. So therefore it cannot be situated hierarchically above monogamy and polyamory. Mm. And in your book, it sounds like you think that novogamy relates to social justice. Can you help, help, help me understand that? Yeah, I don't, I don't make that case where I, I discuss social justice in the book at length because I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, yes. So how does it relate? Yes. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, like uh, all the three different styles can be lived in a way that is more or less aware of social justice and uh, social privilege and oppression. Uh, so, and at the same time, uh, I would say that uh, there is a connection in this, in the way that like uh, a greater number of like uh, minorities today, like transgender community, for example, you know, and queer communities, you know, and also the newest generations, you know, they don't deal well with binaries. <laughs> so when, we're, we're go, when you start kind of like putting people in these binary uh, boxes, you know, like uh, you're kind of like uh, oppressing like uh, implicitly a lot of like these new generations and mi minorities. So in a way that's kind of a bit of the social emancipatory power of Novogamy. Hmm. And, and since you've published the book, have you came up with any ideas that you wish you added? Or is there anything you'd like to add now? Um, I would say that uh, the most important thing is like that um, people really work towards uh, relating with each other, uh, you know, intimately in a, in a gr with greater freedom, in a more free way, you know, because half all being conditioned in different ways, like by society, by religion, by our psychological fears, by relationships. So this kind of like work on oneself is very important to achieve a greater freedom, you know, and uh, from that greater freedom, you realize that, uh, uh, you know, like all the options are equally valid when chosen more freely, you know, and when they live in a way that has is ethical, that is uh, a word of social privilege and, opp and oppression, and also is with care and honesty and transparency and so forth. So yes, I think that that's very important. Thanks so much. And Dr. Ferrer, in your book, you talk about the success and failures of these three different kinds of relationships. Can you talk more about that? Yes, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, one of the ways that has always been uh, kind of like surprising for me is like most people, not only in monogamous relationships, but also in polyamorous relationships, they tend today to, to use the criteria of like a the length, the longevity of a relationship as a criteria of success, you know, and uh, even in poly uh, relationships, you know, it's like, you know, it's like the, the first questions that people ask when you when you say you are polyamorous, they ask you like, oh well, how how long were your relationships, you know, because and if you and if you say that they were like a little shorter or a few years or a few months, it's like you see, polyamory doesn't work, you know, and uh, we need to understand that this is a residual a residual tendency from that kind of like traditional monogamous vow until death pull us apart. And that has kind of like colonized, it's like a mortgage, you know, has colonized all this new way of relationships, you know. So uh, for me, it doesn't really make sense. And I make always these analogies like, uh, you know, when we go to a great dinner, you know, like uh, it's an amazing dinner, it was super tasty, delicious, you know. Dinner is over, we don't say, well, that dinner sucked, you know, uh, because it's over, no? Or a great performance, you know, with the theater, or a great movie, you know, and it's amazing, you love it, it's over, and you say, well, that. That was horrible because it's over. No, we need to evaluate the relationships not because of how how long they lasted or um, that they were finished or not, but uh, by other criteria. Like for example, like uh, the quality of relationship. You know, how much love, how much respect, how um, uh, all these different qualities that uh, and perhaps a relationship that was much shorter. You know was more successful because uh, also it was like really beautiful, you know, and also the also most importantly, like it's healing and transformative power, you know, how this relationship, even if it was difficult, transform me, transform me, made me a better human being, you know, maybe like someone like more available, even more ecologically or socially aware of uh, different problems and so forth. So quality of relationship 
and uh, emancipatory healing, transformative power, I think are much better criteria than like longevity. That's a very excellent point. Thank you.